All right, we're ready for 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, your question for next week will be chapter 13, obviously. And then from there we go into Galatians to finish up the trimester. So, all right, chapter 12. Let's talk about where we've been and where we're going. This is the outline we're following on the book of 2 Corinthians. And here are three major sections. Paul explains his ministry. Paul encourages a collection and Paul answers his critics. It's the last section that we're in. And Paul does respond to his critics that made a number of uh, arguments against him, uh, trying to deny his apostleship because of the doctrine, of course, that he teaches. So let's review where we've been in the first 11 chapters. Chapter 1 was, yeah, comfort and the change in plans, suffering. He talks about the, uh, the agony and the suffering and then the change in the plans. That change in plans may come uh, it would be an important factor in a particular verse in our study today if you haven't already come across that. Chapter 2. Yeah, there was sorrow in his ministry in, for example, writing that first letter was much sorrow. There's joy in the response that he got from it. Chapter 3. Very good. Minister of the New Covenant, not of the Old. That gives us a key to the kind of critics that he has. These are critics that seem to be Judaizing teachers, at least influenced by that, that thought, and that gives us some hint of what's going on. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 go together as a unit, focusing on his ministry. Chapter 4, yeah, consequences of that ministry that he mentioned in chapter 3. Chapter 5 deals with yeah, reasons for his ministry. And then chapter 6, this ministry has demands of this ministry. All right, chapter 7 connects with chapter 2 and the repentance. So chapter 7 deals with an appeal to be received. Very good. Chapter 8 and 9 go together as a unit. Chapter 8. Yeah, collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem, chapter 9, focuses about that same event, but the, the need to give, very good. Chapter 10 is where we shift gears now. This is the third section, it starts answering his critics. So in chapter 10, he is giving a defense of his power and authority, and this power came from God, and he would use this power and this authority, remember that. Then chapter 11, to finish our review up. Yeah, he's boasting of his apostleship. Now he talks about glorying and boasting. Use the term boast in chapter 11. You'll see the term glorying in chapter 12. What does he mean by boasting? Do you think Paul means by that, that I want to brag and I want to tell you how great uh, I am? He uses the term boasting in a different sense probably than we do. What does he mean? Yes, a defense, uh, a confirmation, and we probably wouldn't use that term um, today that, you know, I think I need to boast a little bit. And we'd you'd th probably think, well, you're not supposed to boast. You're not, you know, don't show your arrogance, don't brag about yourself. It's a defense of his apostleship, the power and authority that he has, because that's what's under fire. That's what's under criticism. And so he defends that in the cause of the doctrine that is attached to that. All right, let's talk about a summary of chapter 11. How would you summarize chapter 11? I'm not 11, I'm sorry, 12, that's where we are. All right, deals with his vision and his thorn in the flesh. Two different things, but he talks about those two things. What else? I'm sorry? Further defense of his apostleship and authority, all right? Anything else? Chapter 12. His humility, he does deal with that. I put three things down to summarize. He glories in his apostleship. Is not, would that be the same as his uh, boasting of his apostleship? In other words, uh, in other word, we could strike the word glorying, his defending his apostleship. So there's further defense. That's what he's doing. That's not all he does. He talks about proof of this apostleship. That's part of the glorying. 
And he talks about the signs or the proof of the apostleship and that you saw every bit of any evidence that anybody else may have seen. And he'll talk about that in verse 12 in a moment. Then there's a third thing he talks about here, and that is his love and concern for them. All of this apostleship and my defending of the apostleship is all about you and my caring about you. If he didn't care about the Corinthians, finish my sentence. If he didn't care at all about them, well, he wouldn't be an apostle. What else? That's good. Wouldn't be, say that again. Yeah, he wouldn't care. Yeah. If he didn't care about them, he wouldn't defend all of this attack because the attack against his apostleship is actually aimed at trying to mislead the Corinthians with this, this uh, Judaizing influence. If he didn't care about them, just let them go. Let them be misled. And so this is an important part of defending his apostleship is the love and concern he has for them. So here's what happens in chapter 12. I call it further defense of his apostleship. He talks about reasons to glory and to claim his apostleship. And then he talks about he has signs of an apostle, three verses devoted to that, 11, 12, and 13, and then his love and concern for the church. Make sense? Those are intertwined. Those are not three separate categories of thoughts that are unrelated at all and they don't connect, but they do lace together. Does that make sense to you? So let's start with this, this reasons to glory and to claim of his apostleship. Um, let's start with verse 1. Now, we have some difficulties in chapter 12. Um, let's get a couple of questions uh, out of the way, and then we'll go uh, to our verses. Uh, verse, uh, question number 1, who was the man that was called up into the third heaven? Most likely Paul. Uh, we'll give evidence of that here in a moment, why that's the case. Second question is, why would Paul not glory in his vision? Why would he not... Just focus merely on that. Let me tell you the visions I've had. Not only one, but I've had several visions and, and revelations. Why didn't he just, just fill the letter full of those kinds of things? He told us. Absolutely, yes. He wants to be judged not by that, but by um, the true credentials. And notice that verses 5 and 6, lest, uh, I've lost verse 6, there is verse 6, though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I forbear, lest anyone might think of me above what he sees or hears from me. In other words, if he, if he wrote a letter just talking about all of his visions and his revelations, it might cause people to think of him above that which is written. Does that make sense? And he's still a man, even though he's an apostle, and he doesn't want himself to be the focal point of how great he is, and the great accomplishments are uh, what he wants to focus on really is the message of the gospel, and we'll see that as we go further. All right, let's start here at verse 1. Three things happen in verses 1 to 10. His point is it's not needful or, or it's not expedient to, to glory or to defend or to boast. And what I'm learning when he says, and I'm reading from the New King James, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. Uh, and you, if you are reading from the New King James and you have footnotes, your footnote will say the NU, that's the Nestle's United Bible Society text. That is the minority text. The New King James and King James are based on the majority text. So here's an alternate text. That uh, necessarily, though, not profitable to boast. Well, that gives us a little insight. What he's saying here is, I'm driven by necessity that I can't avoid. In other words, Paul, has, he's already made that point in chapters 10 and 11. I, I don't really want to defend myself and focus on me. I don't want to boast in glory, but I have to do some of that in answer to the criticism. Make sense? I have to talk about my credentials. Uh, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now we're ready for... That should say uh, point A should be 1A and point B should be 1B through 4, uh, actually, because we, we split a thought here at verse 1. He comes to visions and revelations. What's the difference in a vision and a revelation? Vision is something he would have seen and a revelation would be something that he has been told or he heard. 
the, the message may not differ. They both come from God. And so he said, let's come to visions and revelations. Now, let's just pause there. What he's saying is that I don't want to boast. I don't want to focus on myself. But if I did, here's what I could focus on. I could focus on a whole list of visions. I could focus on a whole list of revelations. My, my apostleship is under, under fire. Let me tell you about my visions and revelations. I'll tell you about one, but I'm not going to tell you about them all. And he's going to tell you why he doesn't tell them about them all. So here's the first one that he mentions. He said, I know a man in Christ. Now, there's a big question among commentators. Is, is, is Paul talking about himself or someone else? And he speaks in third person as if he's talking about someone else. But in that he, so what evidence is it that he's talking about himself? Good point. All right, that's one reason why. What, what else would you say in answer to that question? Good, good answer. What makes me think it, or you think it's Paul? You might not think it's Paul. Bingo. That's the biggest key. That he defend, he's trying to defend himself and then tell about somebody else's revelation? Doesn't say a thing about Paul. So this must be about Paul. Now, why did he speak in third person? Well, that's not uncommon for biblical writers. Moses did that, Numbers 12 and verse 3. Moses wrote the book of Numbers, and he wrote about Moses. He mentioned Moses by name, a man Moses. Talking about himself. Um, John, the writer of the Gospel of John, spoke of himself in third person in John 13, verses 23, 24, and 25. So that's not uncommon for biblical writers to do that. Yes. That's true. They are doing that. So he mentions a vision. So let's talk about this vision. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or the body, I do not know. Remember our lesson last week, there's some things we don't know. Paul is saying, here's some things I don't know. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows that. And he was called up into the third heaven. Mentioned in verse 4 as being paradise. Um, now let's talk about the third heaven and paradise, two, those two terms. Let's go to paradise first at verse 4. The word translated paradise here is used in the Septuagint translation in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 to refer to Eden. And so it, 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 the word literally meant a garden. So it, it referred to the Garden of Eden in, in the Septuagint translation. It was used in the Hadean with, with reference to the Hadean realm. It's used that way in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. Thayer says on page 408, uh, 480 rather, that it can and does refer to heaven itself. And so it can refer to heaven, and I think it is talking about the dwelling place of God because it mentions it as being the third heaven. Now, why would it be the third heaven? Well, most understand that, and you may have a different understanding, and that's fine, that the, the, the Bible uses the term heavens in the sense of where the birds fly, and so in, in, in the, where the planes fly, etc. That's in the heavens. That's a biblical term to refer to that. Then in outer space, where the stars are, that's also referred to the heavens. But then there's the dwelling place of God, I think, would be the third heaven. That's the only three ways in which that term is used that I know of. Um, and it probably refers to it in that sense. Now, here's, but this is in a vision now. So you say, was he literally, no, he's taken up in a vision. He's talked about visions and revelation. But anyway, he's taken up into the third heaven, and again, he emphasized I know such a man, but whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Uh, God knows. Now, he says at verse 4 why he can't elaborate more. Why can't he elaborate more in verse 4? All right. It's impossible to express, number one. Number two, it seems to be contrary to God's will. And because God didn't reveal every aspect of it to him. But I was taken up and I, I, was, uh, I had this heavenly vision. Uh, I could talk about that, but I'm not going to expound more on that, is what he's saying. Now, um, he talks about that vision. Now, at verse 4, he ends that, but now beginning at verse 5, rather than focus on that, notice he doesn't say much about that. But, and I want to go back, though, just for a moment to verse 2 and 3. Here's a very practical thing I learned. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He's caught up in third heaven. 
That tells me you can exist without a body. Would you agree with that? There's a part of man, his soul, his spirit, that, that, that lives on eternally without the body. The body could be destroyed, but there's a part of man that lives on. So when a person dies, you don't cease to exist. You don't cease to know. You don't cease to, uh, to have knowledge. You exist outside the body. Luke 16, here's this passage as well. Now beginning at verse 5 now, uh, through 10, he shifts gears now. What, what does he shift to and why? Exactly. He had rather boast in his, and I'd rather talk about the infirmities that I endure than to focus on the visions and the revelation. So look at verse 5. Here's, here's why. Verse 5. Uh, of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. Now why? For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. Now here's the phrase I want you to focus on. I will forbear lest anyone should think of me above what he sees or hears from me. In other words, remember there was a time when the apostles would go into a city and they'd bow down before Paul, for example, and, and want to worship him. He doesn't want that kind of reaction. He doesn't want people bowing down and thinking he's uh, greater than what he is. I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. So he turns to his infirmities. And so in this section 5 to 10, he talks about the thorn in the flesh. Let's, let's read Let's scan through verses 7, uh, 8, 9, and 10. That's all the information we have about this thorn in the flesh. And then stop and talk about what that might be. Now, at verse 7, he said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Let's stop and talk about that. He talks about the abundance of revelation. Paul had many revelations. And we're not going to trace every one of these passages, but the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. You remember that? The Lord appeared to him in Jerusalem, Acts 22, at Troas, at Corinth, at Jerusalem again, on the way to Rome. Remember in that shipwreck? It stood by me, an angel of God this night, etc. And then there's the vision of paradise mentioned here. Now that's just a sampling. Perhaps there were many more that we they're not even revealed. So he said, I could talk about all these revelations and visions I have, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into all of that. But he said, I, here's one thing I do want to focus on. That a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, what do we know about this thorn in the flesh as per the text? I'm not asking you what it is. We've got a question. We'll come to that in a moment. Let's list the, the facts that we know from the text. It's called at verse, let's start listing them. It's called a messenger of Satan. It's also referred to as something that would do what to him? Yet buffet him, lest he be exalted above measure. What does the word buffet suggest? Footnote says to beat. It's, it, it, in essence, beats him down, doesn't it? And so here, here was a thorn in the flesh that beat me down. In other words, kept me humble. Lest I be exalted above measure. What has he just mentioned that may make him feel exalted above everybody else? All the revelations he'd received and the visions he received. Now concerning this thing, here's something else we know. <coughs> what do you do at verse 8? Yeah, he pleaded with the Lord to remove it, and the Lord's answer was, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's talk about the thorn in the flesh. Do we know what the thorn in the flesh was? With certainty. Exactly. But Garvey thinks it was eye trouble. Others have thought it was a headache and migraine. I understand where they get the eye trouble. It talks about what large letters are writing to you. Some think they wrote in large penmanship. I don't know if that's what it meant. Tertullian thought it had to do with an earache. Rosenmuller thought it was gout in the head. Ramsey thought it was malaria. Barclay thought it was epilepsy. The Latin fathers thought it was ungoverned and uncontrolled lust. Others thought it was difficulty in the church. Some think it has reference to Paul's personal enemies. 
they're called personal enemies are called thorns and and messengers at times uh, that makes more sense to me though I can't lock in on that because I, I don't have any evidence of that uh, something is temporary something had a speech impediment and some sort of temptation and that's just the beginning of lit of the list look at some of the thorough commentaries by thorough I'm talking about uh, uh, Linsky and those kinds of commentaries and you'll just find running pages of uh, you'll get bored of reading it I did and so uh, you'll just you'll just get you know starry-eyed reading all that so what was the thorn in the flesh the answer is we don't know now what value is in that and not knowing it's what wasn't revealed to us Yes, that's part of the value of this. And if we don't learn any other lesson, we learn this, we've got, we've got a valuable lesson here. It gives us the opportunity to plug our problems in here. Does that make sense? So let's suppose it's revealed. This, and we're just supposing that it was eye trouble. And so Paul had this thorn in the flesh, eye trouble. I might could relate to that a little bit, but I don't have eye trouble, so it's hard. You, I, you know, it's not, I don't know what, what it's like to have a thorn in the flesh. Uh, or suppose it was malaria. Well, I've never had malaria and probably never will, so I, I don't know how to identify with that. So what was his thorn in the flesh? I don't know. But it was something God allowed to happen to him. Didn't say God caused it. In fact, it's called a messenger of Satan. It beat him down and kept him humble. So it, is there something in your life where you feel like it's beat you down and it's kept you humble? Yeah, maybe, maybe so. So we can plug our own thorn in the flesh in. Does that make sense? It's left blank. Now, here's something else I'm learning from, 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 from that. Let's go through, through this context quick here, if I can see what I did with my remote. What, how did Paul handle that? He prayed. Right, he didn't blame God. He said it was from Satan. So why is God doing this to me? No, he didn't do that. He prayed for its removal, but verse 7 and 8, what else did he do? He didn't rebel, motivated him, yeah. He, what did you say, Jared? Is that you? Or Yeah, he learned to live with that. In other words, he accepted God's answer. I want this removed. Who wouldn't want that removed? But God said no. So he learned to live with it, whatever it was. I don't know. Maybe it was the enemies that kept bothering him. Maybe it was his eyesight. Maybe it was malaria. I don't know what it was. Whatever it was, God said, I think you need this. I think you need this. He looked for some good in it. What good did he see in it? Kept him humble. Kept him on the right track. And he ended up glorying in it. So let's go back to our text and, and then we're going to move on. Look at verse 9. He said, the Lord had said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. What does that mean? All right, God's grace is all he needs. All right, that's good. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Is it, would you agree with this statement that sometimes we become stronger because we recognize how weak we are? How? Good point. Good point. Let's finish verse 9, then we'll come back to what you just said there. Therefore, here was his conclusion from God's answer to that. I almost gladly rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest in me. What do you mean, Paul? Well, look at verse 10. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and in needs and in persecutions and in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then am I strong. Have you ever felt like, to use the term here, being beat down to your knees, where you felt like everything was going well and then you just got your, your feet knocked out from under you and you came to your knees. And that's when you recognize I've got to depend on God and you pray and you pray. And spiritually you became stronger and able now to face the next trial even with greater strength than you did that one. And that's what Paul's saying. He said it was good for me. Now I, I didn't like it, didn't want it, 
but it made me stronger. So, yes. Yes. So what was this thorn in the flesh? I don't have a clue what it was. I say I don't have a clue. I want to, uh, going back to this, if I had to pick one that I said I would favor this maybe as being more of what it could, probably the enemies. But you say the eyesight, we probably both got about as much evidence and we can argue and we're not because we're not going to accomplish anything there. So I, I just say that's probably what makes more sense to me, but I can't lock in on that because that doesn't, I can't, I can't prove that at all. Questions or comments on 1 to 10? We're going to move on. All right, let's go to verse 11 now. And what we have at verse 11, the signs of, of his apostleship. Now, this is part of his defense and his apostleship. Um, I have become a fool. Um, well, let, let me get the point we're looking for here. His point at verse 11 is, you should have and could have commended me. Let's see if we don't see that point. I've become a fool for boasting. You, compel, you have compelled me. I ought to have been commended by you. What's he saying? The Corinthians, finish my sentence now. The Corinthians, instead, let me start over. Instead of me defending myself, you Corinthians should have defended me exactly. Y'all should have been to my defense. Y'all should be dealing with these critics. And now I'm forced to deal with it myself. And so I've been forced to do that. Now, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Has he mentioned that before? And if so, where? Chapter 11, verse 5. Now, if, and I'm not going to go back through that, but that, there's some question. Is that talking about the most eminent apostles like Peter and other uh, high rank apostles, at least high rank, and I put that in quotations in the mind of men, um, the most eminent apostles? All right, if you think that's the case, then he said, I'm not behind them at all. I have everything every other apostle has got. I think it's a taste of, of sarcasm or irony in that he's talking about those that were the false apostles, and I think that's what he mentioned in chapter, meant, meant in chapter 11, verse 5, probably means here. Either case, we come out at the same point. I'm not behind any of those that are considered the most eminent apostles. Now, what makes you say that, Paul, that you're not behind any? Look at verse 12, point B. You should have commended me, but I'm going to commend myself, and here's my evidence. The signs of an apostle were wrought among you. So here, here's a key point to the whole book. Truth, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now, those refer to miracles called signs because they give evidence. They're called wonders because of the effect they produced. In other words, the people stand in awe and they're called mighty deeds because of the power that caused them. So there's no difference in a sign and a mighty deed and a miracle and a wonder. So he said, I did these signs. So when he worked miracles among them, that should have proved when he says, I'm an apostle, the miracle is evidence of his claim, is it not? That's his point. You saw those. Now get verse 13. What's his point at verse 13? Absolutely. In other words, it wasn't that he went over here to this church and worked miracles among them and came to Corinth and, and didn't work any miracles at all. So they missed out on that. No, you didn't miss out at all. So let's, let's, with that point, let's look at verse 13. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches? Now concerning the signs, you saw any sign and any evidence any other church saw, except that I myself was not burdensome to you. The only way in which you were inferior to other churches is I didn't burden you for financial support. And then he says, forgive me, this wrong. That's a taste of, of sarcasm. Is there a place for sarcasm? Yeah, he, he, yeah this letter's full of it. And uh, again, as you may, uh, you may te it, in dealing with your child that you're frustrated with, you may ask them, forgive me for doing you wrong. And it may be something where you haven't done any wrong at all. And that's what Paul is saying. I, I, I didn't burden you, and if that made me less of an apostle, I'm sorry that I did you wrong. <laughs> Maybe you should have supported me. Um, so you're not behind any other church. Make sense? 
All right, let's finish up with 14 to 21. Here's what his, his, it's all about. And, and you tell me, what's, what's the, the mission of his apostleship all about? Remember in chapter 10, exact, say that again, Kevin. Save their, souls. Save their souls. Remember in chapter 10, the spiritual warfare, verses 1 to 5, weapons of warfare are not carnal. And the point we drove home a couple of three times was, this is a battle for the souls of, uh, and the minds of men. Remember that point? All right, that's what he's saying here. So, <clears throat> let's get the, the gist of where we're going and then we'll work through. His point is, what I'm interested in is I'm willing to do anything, make any sacrifice in seeking you and taking care of you. I'm after you and your souls. That's what I'm after. I'm not after your money. I'm not after anything else. Secondly, I was not deceptive with you. That seems to be a charge that was made. I was never deceptive with you. Everything I've done is for your edification, but here's what I fear. I'm fearing that when I come to you that I'm going to find some things I'm going to have to deal with. So let's work through that. Verses 14 and 15 now. Um, verse 14, for this is the third time now that I'm ready to come to you and not be burdensome to you. Let's talk about the third time. We don't have time to develop all the possibilities of the third time. And I'll leave that for you to decipher. Uh, he mentions it again in chapter 13, verse 1. There may have been a visit between the, the first letter and the second letter. Some suggest there's not enough time. I don't know, maybe there was. Even if a few months, he could have uh, squeezed in a, a visit. Others think it's more likely that he's included the, uh, and, and, uh, the, the canceled trip. Remember that chapter one mentioned the canceled trip. Stanley observes, Curry uh, quotes Stanley, that this is the third time I'm ready to travel to you. Once I've actually, uh, I have been actually on the first visit, Acts 18, a second time I intended to come, but I had to change my plans. And the third time, on the present occasion, I'm now ready to come. Uh, and so it's either there were three literal visits or there's three planned visits and one of them was canceled. This is the third time I'm planning to come to you. I'm, I, 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 don't, I want to lean toward the latter. But anyway, here's the point. That I don't want to be burdensome to you, for I did not seek yours, but you. In other words, I didn't look, I wasn't wanting money from you. I wasn't wanting anything from you. I'm interested in you and your soul, and what's his illustration about children? And so, and he's in the place of the parent, isn't he? He begat them with the gospel. So I'm not interested in you taking care of me, I'm interested in taking care of you. That's what I'm interested in. And I'm willing to spend and be spent. In other words, I'm willing to spend everything I have physically, and, but especially himself, for your souls. Now, the latter part of verse 15, it, it's, it's, uh, your translation may be worded as a question. Remember, punctuation is supplied by translators. So which is it? I'm not sure. It may be a statement. He may be saying, uh, somebody's got the ESV. I want you to read that for me in just a second if you've got it. Um, he may be saying, the more I love you, the less you seem to love me. The English Standard, who had that? Read that for me. Read it loud. It raised as a, as a question mark there in that. Yeah. As a sentence. Yeah, and the New King James is Which is it? I don't know. The point's the same. It seems like the more love I show toward you, the less love you're showing toward me. You should have commended me. You should have defended me, and you didn't. Um, now, uh, verse 17, 16, 17, and 18. So I'm seeking you. I was not deceptive. This seems to be a charge. You might mark this at verse 16. Be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with gall. Is he saying that I was deceptive? No. I think what he's saying, he's quoting basically the charge made against him, uh, the money, probably, so what's it referring to? I don't know. Probably the money taken up in the collection, some may have charged that this money he sent Titus and the, the messengers to take up, that he says it for the poor. He, he's, he's deceived us in that. Um, and so he said, uh, my, my point is I didn't take advantage of you, that I sent Titus, I'm reading verse 17, 
Um, and sent him, him, and do, do we not walk in the same spirits and walk in the same steps? In other words, they're not charging Titus with being deceptive. I'm walking in the same spirit, same attitude of Titus. You're not charging Titus with being deceptive. You're charging me. And I'm the one that sent him. You see his point? There is no deception there. Now verse 19. What's his point at verse 19? The thing I'm interested in, and I did everything, I was... Every sacrifice I made, it was for you. Again, do we think that we excuse ourselves to you? In other words, I'm not merely defending myself. That's his point. I'm going to paraphrase the first part of verse 19. But we do all things for your edification. I'm not interested in merely defending myself. I'm interested in you being built up and edified and strengthened and not be led away by these false teachers. Now let's get 20 and 21. Two verses left. We've got time to get them. He's fearful that when I come, I may find, and so this is a warning. I'm ready to come to you, and, and when I get there, here's what I'm fearful of. I fear lest when I come, I may not find you such as I wish, and I shall find you such as you do not wish. But what's he expecting he might find or suspecting? Sinful behavior, contentions, jealousies, ambitions, backbiting, tumults, in other words, division, created perhaps from this false doctrine that has circulated. And lest when I come, God will humble me among you and, uh, and I'll mourn for those that have sinned and have not repented. Okay, I want to make a point from verse 21. Here's a powerful point to be made. Um, verse 21, I, I'm going to paraphrase this, but I want you to watch for the phraseology here. I'm fearful that when I come, I'm going to find people continuing in sin. But there's another way of wording that. I'm fearful I'm going to find people who have not repented. So repentance means there is a change. I learned that from this context. Does that make sense? In other words, you don't repent <clears throat> of backbiting and continue backbiting. You don't repent of uh, whispering and continue whispering. You don't repent of uh, outburst of wrath and continue an outburst of wrath. Does that make sense? There are people who think that you, you repent of something and then you continue in it. Does that make sense? He said if you're continuing in it, you haven't repented of that. Here's a biblical definition of repentance. It means there's a change. You quit the sin, the cessation of sin. That's the point. Yes, yes. Questions or comments? We didn't cover all of our questions. Three things in chapter 12. Time is about gone. Make sense? Good point. Yeah, that's not the purpose of the. He could have just worked miracles upon miracles and wrote a whole book just listing all the miracles. No, he could, he could have done several aspects with reference to miracles, but he didn't. The, the purpose of those was for the confirmation of the claim with Jesus, that he was the son of God, that the apostles, that what they're teaching is true. All right, chapter 13 next time.